Good morning. You are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we did a little bit of work late last week on um, some bill language that um, that had been set aside last year when the pandemic hit in order to give us time to focus on COVID relief. Um, so we've got a little bit of bill language that we went over last week and um, it is my hope that we can move through this and get this bill moving onto the floor of the house. Um, and uh, so we have Carol Dawes with us today. Um, the, the bill as was contemplated last year um, made some changes to town clerk fees. And I just wanted to give you a few moments to, um, to chat with us about your thoughts on the fact that we had left those out of the first round of the bill. Um, it, it, it's it's kind of um, I've got two different points of view. One is darn, it got left out of the bill <laughs> because it, it, in many ways it really is just an administrative fix. We you know it was something that when we uh, adopted the the fee bill two years ago, it was an uh, it w was something we overlooked. Um, it uh, it has to do with recording documents associated with uh, tax sales, which um, are handled the same way as other land documents and so should be charged at the same $15 rate. Um, and so it just was correcting that, uh, that thing that we overlooked. Um, so it was nice to have it as part of this bill. Um, but on the other hand, I certainly can understand that it doesn't really fit into a bill that deals with mausoleums and columbaria and vital records and, you know, which seems to have sort of a, a you know, um, a, a theme to it, a bit of a theme to it. So um, we have uh, shared the language with uh, Ways and Means um, and are hoping that uh, it's something that they will be able to incorporate into um, some of their actions this year. Excellent. That is good to know. Um, and I will touch base with the chair of Ways and Means uh, at our weekly meeting and just um, give her a heads up that you know, this is something we'd like them to take a look at. Um, and I do believe it allows for a more streamlined path for the language that we have uh, in this bill if the bill isn't taking a detour to ways and means because of that. Um, and Tucker, I guess I would go back to you at this moment and say, um, have you been made aware of any uh, questions or concerns or flags that we should be aware of here as we uh, look at moving this bill? Uh, only those that were raised during the last discussion. The last time you met and discussed the bill, the repeals section from uh, H 932 had been inadvertently left out. I added that repeal section back in. I can walk you through that. Uh, the other question that had come up last time was from Representative Higley, whose hand is up now. And that question was about whether sheriffs could serve process and whether any language would have to be added to allow sheriffs or other authorized law enforcement officers to serve process of a health order or an emergency health order. And the answer is that the statute already provides for that. The statute provides that service can be accomplished according to the Vermont Rules of Civil Procedure. VRCP rule number four provides that service shall be accomplished uh, through a sheriff, deputy sheriff, constable, or other authorized uh, officer. Great, Mark, does that, um, does that help you? I thought it did, but then I'm still going back to the actual wording. Uh, so on line 17, it says an emergency order shall be served in person by a health officer or, okay, it says or. I, okay, I'm, I'm happy now. I, I missed the or, I guess. Yep, thanks. All right. And that is, for those of you following along at home, that's on page seven of the draft. All right, any other questions from committee members before we jump into taking a peek at what Tucker put back in? All right, 
Tucker, why don't you point us in the right direction? We'll call it up on our secondary devices and scroll to the right page. Okay, if you all go to the very last page, page eight of eight, section nine, there is a new reader assistance heading which reads repeals effective date. And section nine has been updated to repeal 18 VSA section 5574, which related to the inspection of mausoleums and columbaria uh, that was brought up by the Department of Health the last time this was discussed. Second, it repeals 24 VSA section 2654, which required uh, that the Department of Health um, record in the Secretary of State or send a record to the Secretary of State uh, each time an emergency um, management district formation was approved and determined by the Department of Health. And I believe that was flagged last time by Tanya Marshall. And those are the only additions here. All right, any questions from committee members? All right, so the next, uh, the next thing that I need to do as chair is, uh, is identify which of you lucky committee members is going to um, carry this bill through its floor passage. Um, and so before I do that, um, I guess I would pop to David Englander and say, what do the members of this committee need to be focused on as they think about how to um, explain the value of this bill to their colleagues on the floor of the house? Well, I'd be happy to provide some talking points, but off the top of my head, I, I would say that this is, um, that this, uh, uh, in the case of the, 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 um, the mausoleums and columbaria, this is removing a barrier to municipalities, um, uh, you know, having the opportunity to, to make changes to their cemeteries. It, it, it's a, something that is a, no longer concern. There, there's no health, there are no health concerns. I can say this more articulately, if given a, a mo another moment, and I'm happy to write something, as I said. Um, and so the, so the first thing is that it's, it's an unnecessary, so for, in terms of the columbaria, it's an unnecessary step. It provides headaches for, for towns and it provides a burden on the Department of Health that doesn't have value. How about that for more concise? Um, and in terms of the vital records, um, it, this, this is really, uh, I would say it's, it's some housekeeping that was necessary as a result of a wholesale shift in how the vital records law was changed um, in 2017. Um, and in the case of the health orders, this allows for, um, for the potential of public health hazards to be mitigated more quickly and without, without the, the need and expense, the, uh, the expense and the time involved in, in finding a sheriff to serve it. Thank you. Um, Tanya Marshall, anything else that you would uh, add in answer to the question? All right, so I should have looked it up. I'm, I can't recall off the top of my head who, um, who carried this bill in the 2020 session um, when it did not pass through to final passage. Anybody remember off the top of their head? Ah, I have an answer. So that's actually wonderful because this person happens to still be on the committee. And uh, so I'm going to give Rob LeClaire first dibs at taking this through a second time. <laughs> you know, I would be so honored and fortunate to do that, Madam Chair. Thank you for this opportunity. It doesn't come along often. I, I am just beaming because of your gratitude. Um, <laughs> excellent. Um, so the... If the committee doesn't have any other questions, this is uh, fairly straightforward. Um, David Englander has offered to help Rob, you know, jazz up his floor report from last year, um, which I'm sure he has diligently filed away on his computer somewhere. Um, oh my gosh, yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. Under, under the folder, the most important things I worked on in 2020. <laughs> and failed at. 
<laughs> oh, the failure wasn't yours. It was a victim of uh, COVID pandemic legislating. Um, but I do think that we can uh, probably get this bill moving through the process this year. Um, we have uh, we have fewer emergency COVID relief bills that we are working on as a House and Senate. And so I would hope that this can make it through to final passage <clears throat> this year. And so I'm just going to ask. Be, yeah, let me just. In order? Yes, a motion would be in order. Let me just ask Hal first if he's ready to roll with the with the committee record sheet. I am ready, Madam Chair. Excellent. So I believe that Peter Anthony wants to make the motion. He does. Thank you very much. Gladly. And I'm just so reassured that the man who knows a mausoleum from a columbarian will be will be reporting it out. <laughs> just remember, this is an opportunity to plant some really detailed questions with some of your friends out on the floor of the house. <laughs> All right, Peter Anthony has moved that we um, pass out draft 1.2 um, of 21-0448. Uh, Is that correct, Tucker? Yes, I'm getting a nod from Tucker. So draft 1.2 <clears> point <throat> favorably. This is a committee bill, and so it will technically have to go to the floor for introduction tomorrow. Um, and so when we get done with our work here today, let's see, we'll need Rob and Hal to team up in order to get this to the clerk's office. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Hal, when you are ready, if there's no, I don't see any other hands, last call for questions or comments on the bill. There's no, ar no arcane provision that it, floor report has to be given from someplace that isn't above 80 degrees, is there? <laughs> well, we can certainly talk about that. Um, uh, so anyway, um, Hal, when you are ready, go ahead and call the roll. Okay. I will begin with Gannon. Yes. Mariki. Yes. Leclerc. Yes. Hooper. Yes. Colston. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Bohoski. Yes. Lafave. Yes. Pigley. Yes. McCarthy. Yes. Copeland Hanses. Yes. Great. There are 11 yeses and zero noes, and the vote carries. Excellent. Thank you much, committee. Thank you, uh, David and Tanya, for being with us this morning. And I'm sure Rob will appreciate any thoughts you want to send his way for his invigorating floor report. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. Great. Um, so that completes our work on this bill, but I do want to take this moment while we have Carol Dawes with us. Um, of course, many folks heard the news report this morning uh, regarding a lawsuit um, on the part of uh, some, some title attorneys to compel um, town clerk's offices in Vermont to resume their pre-pandemic office hours in order to allow for... Um, the research that's necessary to conduct um, real estate transactions. And, um, and so Carol, I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that, um, if you have any um, desire to, to dig deeper into this issue with us. Um, so you have the floor. Thank you. Um, first of all, I have not seen the news today. I do believe that there was a, was there a status conference yesterday? Um, and I haven't heard uh, what the outcome I've spent all morning in a dentist chair. So do we, <laughs> do we know um, what, the, uh, what the outcome of yesterday's hearings were? I didn't catch that in the news okay. report, but I was turning my car on as it, as it came up. Did anybody else catch the news report? No. Okay. Um, the uh, I'll try not to let my bias show. <laughs> 
because other clerks who have let their bias show are now being subpoenaed. So, um, yeah, <laughs> the, um, the, the, the Clerks Association uh, worked very carefully, very closely with the Attorney Title Corporation, the Bar Association, VSARA. We had a group of people that got together two years ago to pass the, the fee change bill um, and continued to work together on um, improving relationships between all the stakeholders. Uh, and we actually were working together last year in advance of uh, right when COVID hit, um, we were in contact with the legislature about um, uh, the, the funding for the part of the COVID relief funds that helped us with uh, digitization of land records as a grant. Um, and we really were working together and, and then the um, Connecticut Attorney Title Corporation um, has really taken the stance that um, we're not going fast enough, we're not getting digital documents up quickly enough, we're not opening our doors to them at any time that they think it should be available to them. Um, and in a nutshell, I, I think that their concern, uh, what they're looking for is uh, to move Vermont in the same direction that most other states have moved, which is land records are on a more regional level. They're not on the local level like they are here in Vermont. Um, because they're more regionalized, they have less places they have to go to get the information they need. They have less people they have to deal with. They have less schedules they have to try to work around. Um, and I think that that's their ultimate goal uh, is to try to come up with some uniformity. Um, but that runs counter to what statute is at the moment. Clerks uh, set their own schedules. Um, the way statute reads is that uh, we're, we set our own schedule to be, you know, whatever seems reasonable um, and not every clerk is open 40 hours a week because a lot of the smaller towns, the clerks are part time. Um, but we have worked really hard, particularly during COVID, to maintain uh, as much access as possible while still protecting ourselves, our staff, um, the people, our citizens. Um, and so it's a, it, it, it feels like we're being, uh, we're being attacked for trying to walk that fine line between providing service and protecting ourselves, our staffs, and the public. Um, so I'm not sure, my guess is there will ultimately be things that come out of this um, that, uh, that will end up in front of the legislature. Um, one of the big pushes, of course, is for digitization, um, which is very expensive. Um, we were extremely grateful with the $2 million uh, grant that, uh, that we took advantage of and were able to, many clerks started digitizing for the first time. Um, we here in Barry City were able to expand our online uh, document access uh, and through grant funds. Um, but there, there certainly is a, a demand um, out there from the attorneys from Connecticut Attorney Title Corporation to, uh, to have um, universal digital access. Um, so. So, Carol, for the for the benefit of um, folks who may not have ever spent time in one of our small town town clerk's offices, um, can you just describe a little bit about you know the typical layout of a town clerk's office and where these documents are held and why it presents such challenges in this era of um, this pandemic um, era of social distancing and uh, safety concerns. 
Yep. Um, we actually here in Barry City have a relatively large um, clerk's office. Um, and so we're able uh, now under the, the current guidelines, we're able to have a number of uh, staff members, but our land records are held in our vault. Um, and the vault is small enough that we cannot have more than one person at a time in there. Uh, again, using uh, CDC and ACCD guidelines as far as the number of people per square foot. Um, so because of that, we have to limit the number of people who can be in the vault to one at a time, which means we schedule so that we don't have people showing up and not being able to get in. Um, we, work, we work on a schedule. Uh, that has been really successful for us. I know many other clerks are doing the same thing. Some clerks' offices, unfortunately, are so small that having just the clerk in the office precludes having another person in that office at the same time. And if they, under normal circumstances, uh, someone coming in to do research in the land records would come to their office and then into their vault, they now have two people in a space that's less than 200 square feet and they're now in violation of the guidelines. Um, clerks have been working out all kinds of ways to, they've set up tables out in the hallway and they bring books out to researchers so they can do the research out in the hallway and be at safe distances. Um, clerks are doing a lot of uh, pulling the documents themselves and scanning and emailing them to people who have uh, who have requested them. Um, but we're, you know, depending on the, the physical parameters of their office, uh, that really is dictating um, what the individual circumstances are. Challenging. Um, thank you, Carol. Peter Anthony. Thanks. <clears throat> what I'm about to ask may be uh, overly naive. I, I'm assuming even though the immediately named defendants would be towns that the uh, Connecticut group has targeted, uh, but really it sounds like it's an assault not only on the enabling statute, but also on the uh, health orders that the governor and Levine have issued recently. I assume the state will defend on the behalf of the towns and or the clerks association if they end up being named. I, I, I certainly don't know at the at the moment, the uh, the eight named communities, eight, I think it's eight um, named communities uh, sh are sharing a lawyer um, who is uh, oh, Peter's doing Representative Anthony's doing. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just shocked out if the, if this uh, the burden of this falls on the individual communities. I think the least the state can be is an intervener and supply some of the uh, legal horsepower. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> Carol, are the communities spread out across the state? Big towns, small towns, centered in any geographic area. How did they oh, choose eight? <laughs> they're they're pretty well spread out. Um, I believe that the the choice uh, and they range from Lincoln to South Burlington, um, as far as size is concerned. Um, I do believe that every one of the ones named does not have any online land records access. Um, so I think that that's and that's kind of their baseline uh, of determining. My guess is that's what they use to determine which um, which towns to name. Um, they do they do say that these towns are representative of a of a more statewide problem. So they they seem to intimate that they could have picked pretty much any eight towns. Um. <laughs> the lucky eight, Rob Leclerc. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess uh, I'm going to come at this from a little bit of a different perspective as somebody who has had to avail myself of town records uh, over the years, in particular last year. Um, it has created a really hard, a, a hardship for a lot of town residents to not be able to even get into the town clerk's offices. 
um, when you have attorneys that do need to get in there and do title searches and they can't, aren't even allowed in, say nothing about schedule a time to get in. And I recognize that some of the clerks have tried to get them the information that they want, but there's a high level of uh, discomfort around that because title searches can be very complicated, can be very cumbersome. And it just seems like that there's some clerks out there who aren't looking for a path forward to make this work. Um, I had to get some death certificates here not that long ago, wasn't even allowed in the office. I had to do the exchange through the door and when it was convenient for them. Um, recognizing we got into this thing very quickly, we're gonna come out of it slowly, but I have to say that I think that there's some clerks out there that could do better at making their offices and what they do more accessible to the end users. I, I agree completely. Um, unfortunately, there, there are instances where, um, where we, the association are aware of, of clerks um, who have been uh, less than helpful. Um, the, the challenge, of course, is that uh, most of us are elected officials, and unfortunately, there are clerks out there whose attitude is, you can't tell me what to do. And, uh, and that is a challenge uh, for their community members, for the people who need to use their, their vaults, and for those of us clerks who are trying really hard to to educate them on providing service to um, to their citizens, um, but I I would hope that we wouldn't all be painted with the same brush. Thanks, Carol. Mark Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have to echo what uh, Representative Leclerc was talking about. Uh, I'm sorry that it has come to a. Uh, a uh, legal challenge, but uh, um, I've been contacted by a number of constituents, and and this is this is a life changing issue for them when it comes to selling a piece of property. And I can only say that my town clerks up this way have been more than helpful after conversations to make that happen, to make it work, to get to people in the office however they can, and so that's been a big help. But uh, these are these are critical issues for for folks across Vermont, and uh, and I, I really feel for them. And and I'm I'm hoping that uh, uh, all town clerks can work out something uh, in the event of these uh, very important uh, uh, requests from constituents. Thank you, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, so. I was just reading through the complaint, and it is based on um, statute um, that, and I'm not going to quote the statute, but it seems that clerk's offices have to be open for reasonable hours. Um, so given that much of the law, the, the complaint is based on statute, um, is there, Carol, a potential legislative fix uh, to put some guardrails um, that, that would give um, the clerks protection, but still encourage them to be open? Um, it, actually, there's a couple things, uh, and and it's um, it, it's uh, prudent, uh, not prudent, but it's uh, nice to have Tanya still on this call because one of the things that uh, that she has been um, uh, m trying to move forward this year is uh, the adoption of um, UPERA, which is, and I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but essentially it's um, enabling language associated with uh, electric recording of documents, land records, um, and would provide some um, uh, some uh, additional assistance in creating some uniformity across the state with regards to digital records, access to records. Um, and one of the nice things included in that particular language is the creation of a standards committee 
uh, or some kind of standards body that would uh, that would work together, clerks working very closely with them to develop some standardization for practice, best practices, recording practices across the board. Um, and the hope would be that uh, that that would help address um, some of these issues. Um, we we still will always run into the few clerks who just aren't going to do what they should be. Um, and they're a challenge for all of us to deal with. So I was thinking more along the lines of a COVID-19 um, piece of legislation, um, which might give some better guidance than current statute is to the hours that clerks need to be open. Um, do you think that would help at all? I, there, there has been talk uh, amongst the, the members uh, of the VMCTA members on their listserv about um, what would happen if uh, clerks were designated as essential workers um, and perhaps had some guidelines associated with that. Um, at the moment, we're not considered essential workers. And yet, if you read through the ACCD guidelines, our work is considered essential. And, and it's a little, it, it's, it, it isn't really clear um, the guideline isn't really clear as to what we should or shouldn't be doing. I, I actually had several um, email exchanges with Ted Brady, uh, you know, eight, 10 years ago, uh, months ago about um, needing some more specificity with regards to the guidelines for access to land records. Um, and, and that would certainly be helpful for clerks to hold on to, to, you know, if, if it were more black and white, um, that would be helpful. Um, so. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Carol. Tanya, anything you wanna offer for thoughts on this conundrum? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as Carol mentioned, and I believe Deputy Secretary Chris Winters has reached out to you regarding a possible bill related to the Uniform Real Property Recording Act, um, and also uh, the revised Uniform Law on Notorial Acts. Uh, the Secretaries of States in all the states have been watching a federal bill come through that would kind of push all this through um, within all the states and Vermont is one of the ones that does not have some of this overlay law that can support the town clerks when it comes to land recordings and also uh, remote online notarization. So I think that's uh, the overlap that uh, Carol was mentioning as some possibilities to start um, providing some assistance to towns and also modernization where applicable uh, for land records. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions, committee? All right, well, we'll keep an eye on this. And um, John, if you have thoughts on, on prompting an, a further conversation about, um, about COVID clarification, you and I can certainly chat about getting that um, put together. Um, so thank you for being with us today. Good job, committee, this morning. Um, we are now into the lunch hour, so I think we will sign off and I will see you all on the floor at 1.15 and then back in committee 15 minutes after the